with great pleasure that I introduce Deputy Secretary Rosemary Denninger. Rosemary leads the Agricultural Policy, Research and Portfolio Strategy Group in the Department of Agriculture, Water and Environment. Welcome, Deputy Secretary. Uh, thanks very much and good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a great um, opportunity to um, be part of your uh, Agri-Food Summit this afternoon and to be part of the uh, the panel discussion. Look, I wanted to begin today by um, acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which um, I live and work, the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to past, present and emerging elders. I'd also like to extend that respect to the traditional owners of the lands around Wagga Wagga, the Wiradjuri people, and to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in your summit this afternoon. Um, Andrew and I are both very disappointed that we're not able to join you in person. We have been to your uh, your summits before and uh, they're a really great opportunity to engage with CSU, with industry, with producers, with our state and territory counterparts and uh, others who have a keen interest in the future of Australian ag, fish and forests. But I'm really delighted to be able to make some opening remarks today on behalf of Andrew and then be part of the panel discussion. Uh, firstly, I wanted to make some comments about agriculture as a whole. Um, it really is a remarkable time for agriculture in Australia. After three years of very difficult drought conditions, the industry has leapt from strength to strength. Last year saw the gross value of agricultural production set new records, hitting $68 billion for the first time. And while there have been dreadful challenges in particular areas uh, across Australia, whether it's mouse plagues, bushfires, floods, trade disruptions, the sector is forecast to be worth $81 billion in 21-22. This is a really phenomenal figure beating the previous year's uh, record by $13 billion. We can put this result down to the best winter crop on record, which coincided with very high prices for Australian agricultural produce, at the highest in 32 years. In part, global instability, including the war in Ukraine, is contributing to these higher prices for producers. Uh, I don't think any of us believe for a minute that farming is an easy job and it's been really, really rewarding to see the industry have these record-breaking years. This has translated into a chance to restore the balance sheets. Average broadacre farm cash incomes at the national level are expected to increase by around 40% in 21-22. Uh, through my comments today, I wanted to touch on trade, on biosecurity, on digital uplift, skills and the future outlook. In relation to trade, uh, you know, we are all working in an environment that is contested and increasingly uncertain, a global environment that is contested and increasingly uncertain. And despite this, trade remains strong and we are continuing to develop and strengthen our relationship with our trading partners. With around 70% of agricultural production exported, the rebound in production of the past two years is basically flowing on to our imports, to our exports rather. Um, uh, Andrew Metcalf is very fond of saying we can't just keep eating more and more of our, of our production. So exports is a really important part of, of agriculture. This year, exports are seeing a huge boost and likely to exceed $64 billion, which is a record for the sector. And we've been really working really, really hard to improve the trading outlook for Australian farmers. We currently have 16 free trade agreements in force between Australia and our uh, neighbouring and uh, more far-flung uh, trading partners and in the past year there's been a successful negotiation of an FTA with the UK and an economic cooperation and trade agreement with India. We're also seeing existing trade partnerships strengthened with countries like Vietnam, the US, Thailand, Mexico and Korea and in response to concerns about market diversification we've seen the introduction of a host of programs and incentives and initiatives to assist businesses to explore new markets, including the appointment of Sue McCluskey as a special representative for Australian agriculture. In addition to trade, biosecurity remains a really strong focus for the agriculture portfolio and I know for the uh, sector as a whole. Our world-class biosecurity arrangements have played a really critical role in reducing risk and shaping our nation to become one of the few countries in the world to remain free from the world's most invasive pests and diseases. Our biosecurity arrangements protect many billions of dollars worth of assets, whether that's tourism's contribution to GDP, our agricultural production and exports, and the jobs that exist in the agricultural supply chain. Our biosecurity system relies on really strong partnerships across government, with industry, with the community, and other countries to help manage pests and disease risks. 
which can actually impact on not only on uh, meat and livestock, but of course also on our grain sectors. We know Indonesia is currently fighting outbreaks of lumpy skin disease and foot and mouth disease. And given the high volume of, of exports, we need to continue to be vigilant when it comes to biosecurity. We are at the risk of hitchhiker pests like capra beetle and brown marmorated stink bug. Um, and unfortunately, the biosecurity risk for some of these pests and diseases can't be completely managed at the border. So from time to time, we do need to respond to emerging threats and we need a very resilient and flexible and cooperative system across industry, across the states and territories and with the Commonwealth. The recently released Commonwealth Biosecurity 2030 Roadmap outlines the Commonwealth strategy for the next decade, building on the strategies and uh, actions that are already in place in key priority areas. Uh, as I mentioned, in addressing the, uh, the future threats that come from biosecurity incursions or potential biosecurity incursions, um, the relationships we have with industry, with states and territories, with research organisations will become even more critical. I also wanted to spend a bit of time today focusing on the future challenges and opportunities for agriculture, fisheries and forestry. Um, firstly, to digital. Digital will, um, we think, play a key role in unlocking opportunities in the future, and there is absolutely plenty of potential. It's estimated that the agricultural sector could add about $20 billion to its overall value by embracing the digital sector. Advances in digital technology, in automation, genetics and synthetics will all have the potential to disrupt and change how food and fibre products are made, marketed and delivered. We will see new technology in automating farming systems, accelerating genetic gains and refining input and cost control. And you know, we'll also likely see improved sector and system load performance in relation to market access and biosecurity. Robotics have the potential to have a huge on-farm impact as drones equipped with sensors and digital imaging can monitor crops and orchards for flowering, for water stress, nutrient deficiencies, disease and weeds, all informing automated responses, including drone operated weed control. The digital, the digital revolution can help in supply chains as well, because particularly because accessing premium markets will depend on farmers recording their processes in ways that can be audited and verified and attract premium prices and markets. Integrated data will also help see supply chain management reach back into the farm, making real-time tracking of food and fibre products more of a reality. Of course, the ability to get a competitive advantage from all of these digital innovations and uh, potential uh, changes will increasingly rest on the use of data and engagement with customers and stakeholders. But I recognise that that engagement with digital and with data is a big challenge for the ag sector and those working to support the sector. It's certainly one we will be working with colleagues across government, across the research and development corporations and industry to seek to improve take up and outcomes for our agriculture product producers. An interrelated challenge that we see, and I know that you experience on a day-to-day -day basis, is the challenge for skills in the agriculture sector. I'm pleased to be on a panel today with a number of people leading the way in careers in the agriculture sector. To keep Australian agriculture competitive, we need a diverse skill set as the industry moves into the digital age. Being future ready will mean ensuring the next generation are aware of the exciting opportunities of a career in agriculture. Upskilling, though, of the agricultural workforce isn't something to be done only by industry or only by universities or only by our schools. It's a shared responsibility across industry, government and the education sector, and I'm delighted to say many of uh, whom are in your audience today. And building stronger relationships between industry and education and training organisations, including Charles Sturt University, I think will help prepare students in industry for the challenges to come. This includes having different models for upskilling and retraining through short courses and micro credentials. And we're also working with industry organisations to help young people try out careers in agriculture through gap years. The reality is that we need to have a range of measures, I think, to position the agricultural sector as a modern and innovative and resilient industry. And we're really looking forward to continuing to work with our partners to achieve that and encourage young people to pursue a career in agriculture. And while we're on the topic of skills, I wanted to do a shout out to the Rural Research and Development Corporations who do so much to support innovation and uptake of new research in our agriculture, fisheries and forestry sectors. This includes cross-cutting issues like data and traceability and climate change, 
funded by the industry and government. They are a really key part of our innovation and engagement ecosystem. I particularly wanted to flag GROAG, which showcases Australia's leading agricultural research, technology and commercialisation opportunities. It was launched in 2021 by AgriFutures out of Wagga in consultation with the other rural research and development corporations. And since then, more than two and a half thousand research projects and 100 commercial opportunities have been listed with over 442 connections made. One in three visits to the GROAG platform have been international from countries like the US, New Zealand, India, the UK, China, Germany, Canada and more, while the balance has been from local users. We're really looking forward to seeing GROAG continue to go from strength to strength in supporting innovation and commercialisation in the agriculture sector. Lastly, I wanted to uh, spend a bit of time looking ahead. Um, as I mentioned earlier, agriculture is really thriving at the moment due to a confluence of really positive events. But there are uncertainties on the horizon. Um, the, the dreadful war in Ukraine and its implication for grain markets and food supplies is still unknown. And we are seeing countries start to act unilaterally, including by restricting their exports. And often these measures have the impact of distorting international markets and uh, negative impacts on, on global food security. Uh, at the same time, COVID-19 and weather conditions continue to, uh, to be disruptive. Freight and logistics challenges uh, persist and the global outlook for grains production does not foresee a likely step up in, in production given different uh, weather patterns. Overall, these effects are leading to higher grain and commodity prices, greater volatility, higher input costs, higher inflation and slower growth. So these are not exactly favourable outcomes and we are likely to see their impacts play out over the next few years, given the sector is so trade exposed. But how is this playing out specifically for Australia? Well, it isn't all doom and gloom. Uh, Australian farmers are looking at their third good season in a row, notwithstanding those uncertainties on the horizon. We have seen very good conditions um, leading to favourable autumn conditions, including solid soil moisture and a favourable outlook across most of the country, including the wheat sheep zone. Uh, getting three years of good seasons in a row is, uh, is extremely rare, um, but uh, we've been very fortunate to um, have had that in recent times. Um, obviously, though, um, all good times at some point will come to an end and there's no doubt that uh, at some point dry years will return and uh, we need to uh, make sure that we are prepared for that and that we um, are able to work with our producers to capitalise on the enormous gains that they've made uh, to date. We are seeing um, a growing expectation among governments and consumers around sustainability of our food and fibre and a willingness for consumers to pay increased premiums for sustainably farmed produce. There's also increasing recognition that farming and land management involves land and biodiversity stewardship. Uh, and in line with that, there are moves to establish markets that recognise stewardship as an agricultural commodity in its own right. The presence of carbon markets is also providing new opportunities for farmers to diversify their incomes. And these developments are coming just at the right time. As nations industrialise their way out of poverty, it's expected there will be a very significant increase in the number of consumers in high income countries between now and 2050. This means we can look forward to 3 billion more high income consumers who will want the products that our farmers and fishers and foresters produce and will have rising expectations around sustainability and traceability. Australian farmers have already taken up sustainable farming practices in droves, in particular in broadacre cropping farms, 85% of farms retain stubble, 68% minimise tillage and 65% of reducing the reliance on pesticides and fertilisers. And in livestock farming, 61% are using a variety of grazing management systems and are settling long-term round cover requirements. However, getting this message out to the consumers will require new technology and new ways of thinking. So overall, and in conclusion, I would say that Australia is set for continued beneficial conditions, at least in the short term, with headwinds uh, on the horizon, as I've discussed, given that we are such a trade exposed country. This reinforces, I think, the need to redouble our efforts on skills, on digital, on research and innovation, while continuing to focus on maintaining our world-class biosecurity arrangements and developing new training opportunities. I wish you well for the remainder of the summit and I look forward to our panel discussion. Mm -hmm.